Welcome back. This is the Legacy Bible Podcast, a place where you will hear lessons from the Bible, from the tape archives of the Fellowship Bible Church in Joliet, Illinois. All lessons taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Rains, and I am your host, Marcus Onate. And today we'll bring you another one from our tape archives. Specifically, this is from uh, January 19th. 1995, and it's titled, A Chip Off the Old Block, The Transformation of Simon from Fisherman to Rock. Ah, okay, sounds like a good message. So uh, I have a few announcements afterwards, so make sure you listen to the end. But let's get right to it. So take it away, Pastor Rains. Would you open to the Gospel of John, chapter 1? Gospel of John, chapter 1. I'd like to read with you at verse 40. I'd like to talk with you this morning about a man named Simon. The son of Jonah. John 40, John 1, verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak, now that's John the Baptist. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Jesus told this man, Simon, that he was going to be changed. He was going to be changed. Right now, he was Simon, the son of Jonah. But he was going to be Cephas, which means a stone. He was going to be, and another translation for the same thing would be Peter. First, he had his identity with his father. Who's that man? Why, he's the son of Jonah. He had his identity from his father. His father was his source of being. He came from his father. His father had sired him. He was Simon, the son of Jonah. But the time was going to come, this man Jesus was saying to him, when you're not going to get your identity from your father, but you're going to get it from another place. And you're going to be called a stone. Let's go back to Matthew 16 and see what that other place was. Matthew 16, verse 13, tells us a little more about this change that was going to happen to this man named Simon. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means uh, comes forth from or son of. Simon, son of Jonah, 
Notice that here's where the Lord calls him Simon, son of Jonah. Underscores his origin from his father, his identity with his earthly father. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now look at verse 17. Why was this man blessed? Well, he's blessed now because Jesus says so, but when his brother Andrew first came to him, he wasn't blessed yet. Back there, in John chapter 1, Andrew says what? Let's go back to John 1. When his brother Andrew came to him, John 1 verse 40, again, yeah. he came to him. He first, it says verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated to Christ. Simon didn't know the Messiah. He didn't know who he was, let alone have any identification with him. It was someone he, he had never met, someone he hadn't really ever uh, heard of as far as being there in the flesh. He'd heard of him from the scriptures and the readings in the synagogue, but he had never really heard yet that he was actually alive on the earth and right there in Israel, right then. He had no acquaintance with him. He had no identity with him. Andrew said, come, I want you to meet the one that is the Christ. Yet over here in Matthew, Jesus tells him that he's blessed. And you say, why? Well, because when Andrew first came to him, he couldn't even himself right at that moment recognize Jesus as the Christ. He couldn't. But now, now he can recognize that Jesus is the Christ. Now, he says, Right here in Matthew 16. You are the Christ, verse 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon can recognize the Son of God. Simon can recognize that he's the Messiah, the Christ. He's been changed. Now, that kind of change, even that change where one can truly recognize that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that change requires the work of the Father, the Heavenly Father. Requires the work of God. In fact, Jesus makes it very clear how it was that, that he had come, that Simon had come to understand this about the Lord. Because he says in verse 17, My Father who is in heaven has done what? Has revealed it to you. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father has. That knowledge that Simon had, that Jesus was the Christ, was by revelation, by a work from God the Father. Now listen. Any work of God the Father in you, in this life, will bless you. You let him do that work. You let him give you what he has for you. You let him direct you. You let him have his way with you. You'll be blessed. But if you die without his work in this life, 
What he has to do in the next will not be a blessing. By this time, Simon had actually had a revelation from God the Father as to who it was that stood before him. Not simply the word of his brother Andrew. That isn't the authority for what he says here. Not Nathaniel, not John, not James, but God the Father. Something had happened in Simon. It goes beyond the testimony of other people. It goes beyond what he could reason out for himself. This doesn't mean that reason wasn't involved. But it does lay this down as an absolute necessity. There had to be a work of God in him for him to be changed. And it didn't come from flesh and blood. The Lord Jesus makes it very clear, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You don't get to where Simon was by anything in yourself. You don't get there by anything you can do in yourself or anything you can reason in yourself or others can inform you of or argue with you about. You can't get there simply by logic. Though God is a God of reason, a God of logic, and revelation involves knowledge. But revelation really, for it to work its work, has to go beyond knowledge. It really has to go beyond understanding. It has to go all the way to what the Scripture calls wisdom. A response in our spirit to God according to that knowledge. You know something? When God changes us, it's an absolute, utter, eternal change that he brings. Actually, once Simon was changed, he could never, never again deny who Christ was. I'm going to say that slowly because I want you to suddenly come up with a, an objection inside. I want you to think, wait a minute now. If there was ever anybody that denied who this was, it was this fellow. Oh, really? I want to examine that right here in the book of Matthew up in chapter 26. Let's go to the time when Jesus was being tried. And Simon was following, you know, at some distance, and um, yet he wanted to see what was going on. Matthew 26, he wanted to see what was really going on there in that trial. And so he stayed in the courtyard outside where the trial was going on. Apparently the doorway was open. He could see the Lord Jesus and what was going on. The Lord Jesus could see him. I want to read at verse 69, Matthew 26. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he'd gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were with her, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. Wait a minute. I do not know the man? Jesus asked back there in Matthew, Matthew 16, Who do men say that I am? And they said all different ones. But Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. It was revealed to him by the Father who Jesus was. And now he's saying, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. 
And he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, now that's not the end of the verse, and that's not the end of the teaching. You've got to get this last little thought, or you won't understand. The rest of it says, So he went out and wept bitterly. You see, his denial was outside. His denial was with words. His denial was with cursing even and swearing to kind of underscore. His denial was with everything he could marshal up of his flesh, everything that the world would recognize as a statement of truth. He did his very, very best to pass himself off as a counterfeit. But you see, he couldn't. Inside, he couldn't deny him. Inside, it tore him apart. Inside, he had to deal with the reality. And inside, he broke. And when he left the presence of those people, everything breaking up inside poured out in his tears. He couldn't deny who Jesus was. God the Father had revealed him to him. He was changed. He could never deny him. He could deny him outwardly. He could deny him with swearing. He could deny him with his evil behavior. He could deny him by being part of the crowd in the world. He could go along with the world. He could look like them, sound like them, act like them, and even raise his emotion like them. But he really couldn't change himself back. He couldn't undo what God had done. <laughs> he couldn't Undo the change. And he wept bitterly. I believe that means he wept with shame, with broken heart. Ashamed that he had turned his back on the one that loved him. Ashamed that he had tried to be something that he wasn't. But he couldn't be changed. He couldn't be changed. He couldn't change his relationship to Jesus. Because every one of those three occasions, they claimed, these people looked to him, claimed that he had a relationship with Jesus. And, and he's trying to say, no, I don't even know the man. I don't even know. I have no relationship with him. But the thing he couldn't change was his relationship with the Lord Jesus. The reality of that. It was done. It was perfected, and he was blessed in it. You see... The truth wasn't in the denial. The truth was in the weeping. The truth was in the broken heart. Simon had become what Jesus said he would become. You see, back there in Matthew 16, there's a little play on words. You have to kind of go back there to see it. <clears throat> and, and really, you only pick this up from the Greek. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said this, And I say to you, I also say to you, that you are Peter, we translate it, and actually the Greek word is Petros. You are Petros. Now, Petros means a stone. Uh, and just so you can understand it, we would probably say a little stone. All right? But it would be quite proper just to say a stone in our language, a stone. 
A piece of gravel. Gravel. A chip. A chip. You're a stone. You are Peter, a stone. And on this, and the next word is not, in fact, it comes from the same root in the Greek, but it's not the same word. The next word is Petra. Okay? Peter is Petros. In our spelling, we would end it with O-S. Omicron Sigma in Greek, but O-S. And, and Petra would be just an ending with an A. But you see, there's a great difference between those two words. What does Petra mean? Maybe you know about the city of Petra. In uh, Lebanon today, and uh, over there in the land of the Edomites, <laughs> the capital city, in fact, um, great city carved right out of the cliffs. Why was it called Petra? Well, I think you'd understand if you went down the narrow passageway that one would have to go down to get to the city because it's only wide enough for one camel in many places. And it was there, it was so positioned because of uh, this tremendous defensiveness of this position, because a great army still could only send in soldiers one at a time. And, and it really meant that a small force could hold off a great army and equalize it. So it was very defensible. But as you would go down that natural draw that leads up to the great cliffs that Petra is carved out of, You'd suddenly come into an open place, and there across the open place, you would see against the cliffs great carvings, tombs, really. Beautiful even today of that city, but they're carved out of the great side of a hill of solid rock. Because you see, the word Petra in Greek means immense rock or gigantic rock or we have a word boulder now if boulder means to you something about this big you don't understand this does not mean something about as big as you can get your arms around it means great high exalted mammoth rock that's what the city of petra throws at you when you come down that 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 gully and come into that open place this tremendous great side of a hill with its buildings carved out of solid rock mammoth rock now jesus said you are a stone you're a little chip but on this mammoth rock I'm going to build my called-out assembly. Church here is a translation of the word that means called-out assembly, called out by God. A special work of God was going to happen, yet in the future, to call out certain ones into an assembly that would be a special work of God in the future age. Now, that word assembly, of course, at times is used to speak of Israel. It's used to speak even of um, any gathering, really, in the synagogue or among the Greeks. But in this case, he's speaking of a God called out assembly, yet future, which we know to be the church. And so, looking back, the translator said, well, why don't we just go ahead and put the word in there? My church. We translate it that way later in the New Testament. Let's see this as a prophecy. And so it shows up that way in our translation. Simon, you are a stone, a chip. But it's on this gigantic rock I'm going to establish my called out assembly those that put their faith in me. 
and the gates of Hades shall not prevail fail against it. Now, that's a military phrase. And uh, what it brings to mind is a city. In those days, the cities, the larger cities had walls around them, and they had main entry places that had gates. Okay? And uh, not only were they gateways, they had gates, wooden gates, that they used to close the city off at night and protect it from enemies. When an army came against the city, it usually would strike at the gate because the gate was the weak point. The walls sometimes were 10 feet thick. <laughs> and sometimes they were what we would think of as three stories or four stories high. But then there was a little wooden gate. And they would attack the gate. And they would try to burn the gate. They'd shoot, shoot arrows at it that were, had flame on them. They'd run up and pile uh, bramble in front of it and light the bramble and try to burn the gate down. And then they would try to run uh, carts into it that were loaded with stones and try to break through the gate. They would do many, many things to get through the gate. And if the gate stood up against the attack, then the gate prevailed. But Jesus said, This called out assembly is going to be like a mighty army against the gates of Hades. And the gates of Hades will not prevail. What does that mean? This called out assembly will have power enough to crash through the gates of Hades. Oh, does that mean that uh, we have a doctrine like the Mormons, you know, that after you're dead, you go to the, the, the temple and you get anointed for your second cousin now deceased 40 years and get him out of wherever he is and get him into paradise? No, no. We have no way that way to empty Hades. There is no such doctrine. You can't interpret this verse to mean anything like that. And if you engage the church in emptying out the place of the dead, you, 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 you contradict statement after statement about the finality of death. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. It is an errant teaching. The prevailing against the gates of Hades is right now in this life. Hades is the abode of the ungodly dead in the present age. Hades is, by the way, going to be emptied. Going to be emptied at the great white throne. All of Hades is going to give up the dead in it, and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. We know that the Lord speaks with precision. Hades is the present abode of the ungodly dead, and the job of the called-out assembly is to stand against the claim of Hades on the souls of men right now. And we can prevail by the power of Jesus. Well, you know what would open a gate? A lot of fire? Yeah, that'll work. A big war machine with loaded with rocks? Yeah, that probably would work if it was big enough and ran fast enough. But the Lord has something that's a lot easier. It's called a key. You just go up to the gate and you unlock it. And so he says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. By those keys, you're going to prevail against the gates of Hades. What's the kingdom of heaven? A lot of discussion about this among theologians. But I'm so glad that the common, everyday Christian reading his Bible almost consistently comes up with the right answer about this. I suggest on this one that you read your Bible first and read the theologians later. As with most truth, <laughs> actually. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven 
is a kingdom made up of all those destined for heaven. What would you call them? I'd call them believers. I don't deny the fact the Lord's going to have a kingdom down here on the earth. Don't deny that at all. I'm looking forward to it. But the kingdom of heaven really looks beyond that and sees, in a general sense, the saved. And I think what he's saying is, Peter, I'm delivering to you the great power and privilege in my name of being able to bring the gospel to the lost and giving to them the message that will bring life, that if they by faith will trust in me, this is the teaching of the whole of the New Testament, if they by faith will trust in me, they'll be delivered from death, the, the claim of Hades upon their soul. They'll be delivered. You'll prevail against the gates of Hades. You'll open to them life with the message of truth, of salvation in the blood of Jesus. And then he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You will have power, you'll have authority in my name to bring about changes that last. Now, by the way, we can't save anybody. We can't really change anybody. Do you know that? I hope you do. Only Jesus saves. Peter couldn't save anyone. Peter couldn't take somebody and thrust them into the kingdom. But in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the power of the Lord Jesus, he could come to them and bring the message of deliverance, of victory, of salvation in Christ. And Jesus could save them. Jesus could change them just the way Peter got changed by God. To bind and to loose is great authority. But he was not being given authority in his own name. He was not giving, being given authority in his own to his own glory, by his own will. He was being given instruction that available to him in the will of God, in the name of God, in the authority of God, to the glory of God. He would have the great privilege of serving. Peter's problem was he had to let God change him and change him so he could be that better, that better servant. And we read along, we find out some of the changes that had to be made. Uh, in the 16th chapter right here, there's a rebuke that he had to go through. First, he uh, got involved in this thing about whether Jesus should die or not. Verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Can you imagine this man rebuking the Lord? I'm telling you, he had to be changed. You don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be saying, Lord, you're wrong. <laughs> now, listen, if you think Peter's the only Christian that ever did that, I've heard a lot of you say, oh, I don't know why God did this. I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know why he let this happen. I just don't know. It's just not right. I know you all say I'm wrong. I, I'm falsely charging you. But there are a couple of you out there that have done that. Amen? Okay, I heard two.
Peter, you're going to have to be changed. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, if he could become mindful of the things of God and stop being mindful of the things of men, he would be changed. He was changed by relationship. He stopped being identified with his father, Jonah, and now he was identified with the big, gigantic rock. He was now a little stone. Who's that fella? He's one of his disciples. Right? That's what happened at the courtyard. That girl didn't say, you know, that's the son of Jonah out there. No, they said, he's one of his disciples. He's a stone. Oh, God made the change, absolute and complete and eternal. But now there was an ongoing work that had to go on. Did you know that even though you get saved in an instant, it takes a lifetime of changing by God to really make you what you want to be? That was that way with Peter. Here he's going along. He's identified with the Lord Jesus. Do you know he starts rebuking the Lord? And the Lord says, no, listen. <laughs> this is only happening because you savor the things of men. You've got to learn to start putting first priority on the things of God, Peter. And you'll have that interchange that God did in an instant. Then you'll have that interchange showing outwardly. Well, he learned something from that. You think, hmm? Verse 28. Surely I say to you, there's some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And you read chapter 17, and you find out that he took James and Peter and John, and he took them up on a mountain, and he was transfigured before them. And while they're up there, they're seeing Elijah and Moses and Jesus talking together. Peter opens his mouth. Verse 4, Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You can see how spiritual he is, right? If you wish, well, he's wise. He's learning how to look for the Lord's will. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And all of his spirituality just fell to the floor. He does not yet see the Lord high and exalted as the only king, as the rock exalted, as the boulder. He doesn't see it as he has to see it. And so, after the conversation with Moses and Elijah, they're gone. The Father speaks, says, this is my beloved son. in whom I'm well pleased, hear him. When the disciples heard that they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid, but Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. How wonderful he is with us, how gracious. And verse 8, when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Jesus only. No Moses, no Elijah. Peter had to let God change him so he could just see not three, not two, but one. Jesus only. The changes had to go on. He had to uh, deal with one time when the there was a boy that they couldn't heal. It had been brought to the disciples. The father brought him to the disciples. They couldn't heal him. And finally brought him to Jesus. He said, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And Jesus rebuked the demon that was in him. And then he explained. 
This kind does not come out but by f uh, prayer and fasting. And he says to that the, the, the disciples that were standing there, he rebukes them for their weakness of faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Peter had to learn to be a servant by faith. He had to learn to be a servant by prayer. He had to learn to deny the flesh. That's what fasting is all about. Concentrating on the things of God. Realizing at times there are battles where you just cut yourself off from this world and even all that it strengthens you with and supplies for a time, and you do the business of God. He had to learn that. And he had to learn to see him in his glory that he had seen on the mountain. He had to learn to see him in that glory without trying to share it with him. He got into a debate about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And James and John even had their mother come and kind of promote them, you know. And, you know, Peter starts to grow a little bit here. And, and he, with the other ten, it says the other ten, Peter's not named specifically. He's with the other boys there. The other ten are angry with Peter, I mean, with James and John because they got their mother to speak for them. And I see Peter there, you know, with them, saying, oh, shame on you fellas, wanting this glory. Well, of course, they were wrong. But Peter hadn't won the victory totally. They're still wondering about when the kingdom's going to come and who's going to reign there. And, and Jesus finally rebukes them and said, Now, in my kingdom, there will be 12 thrones, and you will sit on them. You know what he's saying? Your time for glory is not in this world. It's later. Don't worry about it. Just learn to be a servant. Learn to be, and the word there means slave learn to be a slave. That means submissive, setting your own will aside. If you want the change that he's made in you when you got saved to be evident, if you really want to be seen as a stone, as a chip off the larger stone, it's going to require surrender, walking with him, delighting in him, it's going to require being willing to be a servant, not delighting in the things of the men, of men and of the world, but in the, delighting in the things of the Spirit of God, so that the change can be seen. So that when you write your book, like Peter did there in 1 Peter 5, you know what he calls himself? He speaks to the elders, and he calls himself an elder. And he tells the elders to feed the flock of God. Jesus told him that in John 21. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, if you love me, if you love me, if you love me. And Peter finally, as that change of really being the stone he was, starts to be seen more and more. He says to those other elders, now listen, men, you're going to have to be shepherds. This is the old filthy mouth fisherman now, the old coarse fisherman, saying, now what you've got to do is be tender, gentle with the lambs. Give them the word of God, feed them, take them along, lead them, and, and show them Jesus so that they'll let him change them. And he teaches them this, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and in due time he will exalt you. That came out of the mouth of Peter. He was changed. He was changed in an instant into being a child of God, but it took time and surrender for God to change and get rid of that flesh and that reliance on the flesh and to let his stoneness be seen, his identity with Jesus be seen. 
That's what God wants for you. You don't know him as Savior. He wants you to be one of his stones. Get your identity from the boulder. And if you know him, then to let Jesus be seen. And let him work all the changes necessary in you to get rid of all your reliance on the flesh so Jesus will be seen. And the change will be evident to all. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the work of the Spirit in us. Thank you for the change that comes by his work in making us like Jesus. Only, Lord, only as we draw back from our trust in the flesh and in the things of man and the things of the world and learn to savor the things of God. Learn to focus on Thee and see Jesus only. Learn to be a shepherd. Lord, help us learn humility and servanthood and just be stones. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so there we have it. Thank you, Pastor Rains, for another great message about Simon becoming, uh, I mean, yeah, Simon becoming Peter, the rock. <laughs> That's a good one. And that was uh, suggested by, uh, by our team member here, Jeff. He's been reviewing the tapes, and he suggested that one. So I put that one on as soon as I could, which is today. So thanks, Jeff, for picking out a good message. All right, so announcements. Yes, we still have uh, cards. We still have postcards if you'd like. We could send you out some. You can use them to put on your literature table in your church or mail them out to your friends. So you can go to the website for that and submit your address. And speaking of the website, there's some... Uh, some new things going on there. I have the YouTube channel now located on the website. So you can, instead of going to YouTube and looking it up, you can go to the, the website and see the YouTube channel there. And you can listen to it that way. Or there's just a regular audio player where you can hear the, uh, the audio-only version from, uh, from Podbean. Just the same. It's the same message. But if you want to listen to that, we got that. There's transcripts there now that we have. Uh, my sister's been working on. So there are transcripts of the message. If you want a nice uh, edited copy of the of the message that was uh, preached today or in the past, I think we got them back to episode 37. I think it's 37. So you can uh, you go there and get them there. Plus, I've been working on, uh, you know, kind of just generally fixing up the website, trying to get more information up there because I want to make it a, a good resource to, to pick up uh, information, not only on the podcast, but just on uh, general information for Bible study. So that's just a work in progress. So keep going back there. And the address for that is www.legacybiblepodcast.com. And if you go there, you'll be able to see all the latest changes that are going on. So thank you for listening. I really, really, really appreciate the, the listening. I know for October, um, the listens have really gone up. And I'm hoping now or into November that the November listens go up even more. And hopefully, You'll be inviting your friends and your family. And so if you are doing that, thanks. If you're not, why not get to it? Okay. So thanks for listening. And I'll see you again next week. And have a great day. Have a great week. I'll see you next time. So long.